Um, Sanjay ji, are you okay and ready? Uh, or uh, minute? Yeah, I am ready. I am ready. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. <coughs> I so normally read it from my diary, so. Okay. Either way. Okay. Jai Baba. Avtar Meher Baba ki Jai. Have to love God. To love God in the most practical way is to love our fellow beings. If we feel for others in the same way as we feel for our own dear ones, we love God. If instead of seeing faults in others, we look within ourselves, we are loving God. If instead of robbing others to help ourselves, we rob ourselves to help others, we are loving God. If we suffer in the suffering of others and feel happy in the happiness of others, we are loving God. If instead of worrying over own misfortunes, we think ourselves most fortunate than many, many others, we are loving God. If we endure our lot with patience and contentment, accepting it as his will, we are loving God. If we understand and feel that the greatest act of devotion and worship to God is not to hurt or harm any of his beings, we are loving God. To love God as he ought to be loved, we must live for God and die for God, knowing that the goal of life is to love God and find him as our own self. Avtar Meher Baba Ki Jai. Avtar Meher Baba Ki Jai. Thank you. So uh, today we'll continue with uh, part seven and we will we will take up after love the conditions of happiness. Any uh, uh, discussion points or quick questions, we can take it now. Otherwise, we'll go straight to the reading. Okay, I take that as a green light for reading. So the page number is, those of you following on the physical book, it's 388, Conditions of Happiness. Altar Mehar Baba Ki Jai, part one, the overcoming of suffering through detachment. Everyone seeks happiness. Every creature in the world is seeking happiness and man is no exception. Seemingly, man sets his heart on many kinds of things. But ultimately, all that he desires or undertakes is for the sake of happiness. If he is keen to have power, it is because he expects to derive happiness from its use. If he strives for money, it is because he thinks it will secure the conditions and means for his happiness. If he seeks knowledge, health or beauty, science, art or literature, it is because he feels that his pursuit of happiness is directly dependent upon them. If he struggles for worldly success and fame, it is because he hopes to find happiness in their attainment. Through all his endeavors and pursuits, man wants to be happy. Happiness is the ultimate motive power which drives him in all that he does. Intertwining of pleasure and pain. Everyone seeks to be happy, yet most persons are immersed in some kind of suffering. If at times they do get small installments of happiness in their lives, it is neither unadulterated nor abiding. Their lives are never a series of unmixed pleasures. It moves between the opposites of pain and pleasure, which are ent entwined like darkened clouds and shining rainbows. The moments of pleasure occasionally appearing in their lives soon vanish like rainbows which shine in their splendor only to disappear from the sky. If these moments of pleasure leave any trace, it is of a memory that only augments the pain of having lost them. Such memory is an invariably is an invariable legacy of most pleasures. Desire bears two kinds of fruit. Man does not seek suffering but it comes to him as an inevitable outcome of the very manner in which he seeks happiness. He seeks happiness through the fulfillment of his desires, but such fulfillment is never an assured thing. Hence, in the pursuit of desires, man is also unavoidably preparing for the suffering from their non-fulfillment. 
The same tree of desire bears two kinds of fruit, one sweet, which is pleasure, and one bitter, which is suffering. If this tree is allowed to flourish, it cannot be made to yield just one kind of fruit. Those who have bid for one kind of fruit must be ready to have the other also. Man pursues pleasure furiously and clings to it fondly when it comes. He tries to avoid the impending suffering desperately and smarts under it with resentment. His fury and fondness are not of much avail, for his pleasure is doomed to fade and disappear one day. And his desperation and resentment are equally of no avail, for he cannot escape the suffering that results. Changing moods. Goaded by multifarious desires, man seeks the pleasures of the world with unabating hope. His zest for pleasure does not remain unalloyed, however, because even while he is reaching for the cup of pleasure, he often has to gulp down doses of suffering. His enthusiasm for pleasure is abated by suffering, which often follows in pleasure's wake. He is subject to sudden moods and impulses. Sometimes he is happy and elated. At other times, he is very unhappy and downhearted. His moods change as his desires are fulfilled or frustrated. Satisfaction of some desires yields momentary happiness, but this happiness does not last and it soon leads, leads to the reaction of depression. His moods subject him to ups and downs and to constant change. Suffering caused by desires. Fulfillment of desires does not lead to their termination. They are submerged for a while only to reappear with added intensity. When a person is hungry, he eats to satisfy the desire, but soon feels hungry again. If he eats too much, even in the fulfillment of his desire, he experiences pain and discomfort. It is the same with all the desires of the world. They can only yield a happiness that is fleeting. Even in the very moment of their fulfillment, the happiness they yield has already begun to fade and vanish. Worldly desires can therefore never lead to abiding happiness. On the contrary, they invariably invite unending suffering of many kinds. When an individual is full of worldly desires, a plentiful crop of suffering is unavoidably in store for him. Desire is inevitably the cause of much suffering. This is the law. Mitigation of suffering of desires through suffering. If a person experiences or visualizes the suffering that waits upon desires, his desires become mitigated. Sometimes intense suffering makes him detached from worldly life, but this detachment is often often again set aside because of a fresh flood of desires. Many persons temporarily lose their interest in worldly objects due to the impact of acute suffering brought on by desires, but detachment must be lasting if it is to pave the way for freedom from desires. There are varying degrees of detachment and not all of them are lasting. Temporary detachment. <clears throat> Sometimes a person is greatly moved by an unusually strong experience such as seeing someone die or witnessing a burial or cremation. Such experiences are, are thought provoking and they initiate long trains of ideas about the futility and emptiness of world ex worldly existence. Under the pressure of such experiences, the person realizes that one day he must die and take leave of all the worldly objects so dear to him. But these thoughts, as well as the detachment born thereof, are short-lived. They are soon forgotten and the person resumes his attachment to the world and its alluring objects. This temporary and passing mood of detachment is known, uh, known as Smashana Vairagya. <clears throat> Cremation or burial ground detachment because it usually arises when witnessing a cremation or burial and stays in the mind only while in the presence of the dead body. Such a mode of detachment is as temporary as it is sudden. It seems to be strong and effective while it lasts, 
but is only sustained by the vividness of some experience. When the experience vanishes, the mood of detachment also quickly passes without seriously affecting one's general attitude toward life. The passing mood of detachment might be illustrated by the story of a person who once saw at the theater a spiritual drama about Gopi Chanda, the great Indian king who renounced everything in pursuit of truth. The drama impressed him so deeply that disregarding all his duties to the family, he joined a band of Bairagis, wandering ascetics belonging to the cult of Gopi Chanda. Renouncing all his former modes of life, he dressed as a Bairagi, shaved his head and sat under a tree as advised by the other members of the group. At first, he plunged into deep meditation, but as the heat of the sun grew stronger, his enthusiasm for meditation began to cool down. As the day went on, he began to feel hungry and thirsty and became very restless and miserable. When the members of his family noticed his absence from home, they became worried about him. After some searching, they found him under the tree in this miserable plight. He had grown haggard and was plainly unhappy. His wife, seeing him in this strange condition, was furious and rushed to upbraid him. His mood of detachment had flitted away, and as he was thoroughly tired of his new life, he took her reproach as a boon from heaven. So silencing her quickly, he put on his turban and ordinary clothes and meekly followed her home. Intense dispassion. Sometimes the mood of detachment is more lasting and not only endures for a considerable time, but also seriously modifies one's general attitude toward life. This is called Tibra Vairagya or intense dispassion. Such intense dispassion usually arises from some great misfortune, such as the loss of one's own dear ones or the loss of property or reputation. Under the influence of this wave of detachment, the person renounces all worldly things. Tivra Vairagya of this type has its own spiritual value, but it is also likely to disappear in the course of time or be disturbed by the onset of a recurring flood of worldly desires. The disgust for the world that a person feels in such cases is due to a powerful impression left by a misfortune and it does not endure because it's not born of understanding. It is only a severe reaction to life. Complete detachment. The kind of detachment that really lasts is due to the understanding of suffering and its cause. It is securely based upon the unshakable knowledge that all things of this world are momentary and passing and that any clinging to them is bound eventually to be a source of pain. Man seeks worldly objects of pleasures and tries to avoid things that bring pain without realizing that he cannot have the one and eschew the other. As long as there is attachment to worldly objects of pleasure, he must perpetually invite upon himself the suffering of not having them and the suffering of losing them after having got them. Lasting detachment, which brings freedom from all desires and attachments, is called Purna Vairagya or complete dispassion. Complete detachment is one of the essential conditions of lasting and true happiness. For the person who has complete detachment no longer creates for himself the suffering that is due to the unending thraldom produced by desires. <clears throat> Opposites. Desirelessness makes an individual firm like a rock. He is neither moved by pleasure nor by sorrow. He is not upset by the onslaughts of opposites. One who is affected by agreeable things is bound to be affected by disagreeable things. If a person is encouraged in his endeavors by an omen considered auspicious, he is bound to be discouraged by one considered to be inauspicious. He cannot resist the discouraging effect of an inauspicious omen as long as he derives strength from an auspicious one. The only way not to be upset by omens is to be indifferent to auspicious as well as inauspicious omens. Praise and blame. The same is true of the opposites of praise and blame. If a person is pleased by receiving praise, 
he is bound to be miserable when he receives blame. He cannot keep himself steady under a shower of blame as long as he, as he is inwardly delighted by receiving praise. The only way not to be upset by blame is to be detached from praise also. Only then can a person remain unmoved by the opposites of praise and blame. Then he does not lose his equanimity. The steadiness and equanimity that remain unaffected by any opposites is possible only through complete detachment, which is an essential condition of lasting and true happiness. The individual who has complete detachment is not at the mercy of the opposites of experience and hence being free from the thraldom of all desires, he no longer creates his own suffering. Physical and mental suffering. Humanity is subject to much suffering, physical and mental. Of these two, mental suffering is the more acute. Those with limited vision think that suffering can only be physical. Their idea of suffering is of some kind of illness or torture of the body. Mental suffering is worse than physical suffering. Physical suffering sometimes comes as a blessing because it serves the purpose of easing mental suffering by weaning away one's attention from the mental suffering. Abiding happiness through desirelessness. It is not right to make much of purely physical suffering. It can be borne through the exercise of willpower and endurance. The true suffering that counts is mental. Even yogis who can endure great physical suffering find it difficult to keep free from mental suffering, which is rooted in the frustration of desires. If a person does not want anything, he is not unhappy under any adverse circumstances, not even in the jaws of a lion. The state of complete desirelessness is latent in everyone and when through complete detachment one reaches the state of wanting nothing, one taps the unfailing inner source of eternal and unfailing happiness which is not based upon the objects of the world but is sustained by self-knowledge and self-realization. That brings us to the end of the part one of conditions of happiness. Any comments and questions before we move on to part two? Just one comment, if I may say, speak. Can you mm -hmm. hear me? Yes. So I think uh, there's a lot of uh, <coughs> importance and significance given to equipoise, as in both sides, you know, in terms of praise or blame. Or inter uh, so, I mean, we have to be equan equanimity which leads to happiness is what I could understand from this. Correct. So that's a very significant thing that we have to be, you know, detached or not get moved by good and bad. So all opposites. And it talks about self-knowledge and self-realization. So this is a very good, uh, practical chapter. And I would say even with this uh, Shamshan Vairag, you have many through it. Correct. Jai Baba. Yeah, the, this is again one of those chapters that is deceptively simple and straightforward. But then uh, the, the the practical usage of it is, uh, I mean, practical application of it in our lives is obviously the complicated part. Uh, but it is a it's a template and formula for how uh, how uh, he explains what the role of desires is and what the go how to get to real happiness right so it's it's a mathematical deduction of that yes yes yeah any other questions or comments? how to understand the state of complete desirelessness is latent in everyone Ooh. okay <clears throat> that i think is yeah go ahead mama uh, uh, what came to my mind was uh, the meaning of attachment and detachment uh, has to be, uh, say, pondered on. So we are the self. Something gets attached onto us and we would like to detach from that. So it is not uh, all the attractions and uh, things are not uh, part of us is coming from outside that realization uh, 
we need to gather us so that the concept of this attachment and detachment can be clearly understood i feel correct yeah you know when we are born as human beings right from childhood it seems like attachment is latent in everyone not detachment because we get attracted to small small things the child you see rings and bells he tries to catch it so we are born with looks like we are born with attachment not detachment and we have to work towards detachment and where is the latent um, you know uh, we keep talking about I love think, is uh, latent yeah. attachment is latent so how to see that latent yeah. Yeah. part of ourselves so if you look it's, at the, i think uh, it is sorry yeah go ahead right. you, ravi or sanjay yeah, sanjay i mean yeah. sanjay yeah. yeah so i think it is corollary to the baba's uh, baba saying that is like a river which has destined to uh, merge with the sea or every soul is destined to see the over soul and merge in that so in in that context it rhymes actually it's the same thing complete desirelessness because unless there is a desirelessness then only that is possible but say so yes uh, baba is understood yeah baba. Baba. i'm trying to find the latent part in us <laughs> <laughs> which is hidden somewhere yeah yeah so that has to be understood that is the effort that... part intelligent action yeah jay baba <laughs> Yeah, Jay Baba, this is Ranga. Go ahead. Can I say something? Yeah, Ranga, go ahead. Yeah, yeah. So I just wanted to um, add a little bit of uh, scientific evidence, you know, to happiness. And so there was this Hungarian uh, scientist. I don't remember psychologist. I don't remember his name. It's very complex. His first name is Mihail. So um, he wrote a book called Flow, which is based on about thirty years of study of happiness. so he put a postulate down saying above everything and that's what is there in this chapter as well that men and women want to find happiness so what he did was that uh, the experiment was not done in india but many other countries over 30 years so he gave a pager to all successful people so he said uh, if um, uh, success is linked to happiness then people must be happy and interest and he, he told those people that i will uh, i will randomly call you and you need to tell me what you're doing and when he actually compiled his notes he found that people were not actually happy when they they were sitting serenely or on a beach or something like that but in the midst of some very very stressful activity so this is exactly the opposite of uh, this eventually when he went he 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 came up with this whole theory of so w- what what he really discovered from a scientific evidence was that uh, as man has evolved we kept on filling things in our lives in terms of activities and with the advent of technology and knowledge uh, this whole uh, thing has shifted to how we can free up our time but we don't utilize that time and then eventually he came to a postulate called the spiritual energy and spiritual entropy which is very interesting so he called this whole concept as flow which was the moments of happiness so i just thought i'd just share this little yes. different perspective uh, but it was totally contrary in terms of the evidence so this connected for me in this chapter with all the types of vairagyas so that means there there are these various moments uh, which uh, help us to pause and reflect but we seem to ignore and just move on so that is that is my connection to that and this thank you jay baba very interesting very interesting so uh, uh the, the, the spiritual energy and entropy right? so the, what is this summary of the findings that's that's uh there is there is no such summary but what he found was that it is only under stress and duress that people are genuinely happy they are not happy when they are you know when they have really accomplished something <laughs> which very interesting kind of talks about yeah. this vairagyas <laughs> very interesting so uh, just to attempt to answer uh, sunil's question right so kam koti is uh, raising a hand oh go ahead kama yes. just jump in entropy we don't use the yeah, raise hand there are can you hear me yeah 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 hey yeah, baba yeah i think first of all what ranga said about the book flow i have read it myself it's a beautiful book and uh, rather than talking about stress yes there is an adrenaline rush you know but i think that uh, the way i interpret the book is like when you are doing something you love you are in flow okay mm-hmm. and uh, it's a very interesting book to read 
And the uh, second part is coming back to question uh, complete desirelessness that uh, Sunil was mentioning. Uh, what I feel is that, you know, we have been talking about Vivek and Vairagya, discrimination and detachment. Now in this chapter, detachment can also be talked about like this passion. Okay? Now, when we talk about discrimination, there is an part in discourses where we read something called CCD, uh, creative, critical discrimination. Now, how do you get discrimination? Uh, one of the things is by reading a book like Discourses and Bob Speaks, which gives us the roadmap of life. It is a form of, uh, you know, gives us a roadmap how to discriminate about things. Uh, second thing is about detachment. Only when you have discrimination, you are able to figure out where to be, you know, how to be detached. You know? It's all about how. Now, when we go back to uh, what Sunil said, it's correct. Uh, when you look at the big picture, top down, of the most original book, what we see is the most original created the who am I? And then we had to go through this whole different kingdoms and we gathered the typical uh, variables, lust, greed, anger. Okay? Now these things are latent within the human being, which we call as organic samskaras and inorganic samskaras. Inorganic samskaras has to do with the human being, organic samskaras have to do with the animal being. So what we are actually it's, we are getting detached from the lust, greed, and anger which we have developed in evolution. And the beauty is, we also have come across the needs and wants. The needs that we have is we need to have air to breathe, water to drink, and food to eat. Roti Kapramata, like the Maslow's hierarchy. So the question here is that once the needs are fulfilled, most people today are suffering from attachment to wants, whether it's a car, family, so on and so forth. So the fundamental thing is we are all jivatmas as a human being and the only goal is God realization. So once you're a human being, you don't need to have any kind of attachment to anything, desirelessness. But because of all these sanskaras, we are attached to things and this is this whole process. So I think the three kinds of vairagya, uh, shamshan bhumi vairagya, which happens to all of us. Like, for example, I'm going to uh, uh, my uh, aunt drop her body. So typically everybody can kind of understands that, yeah, you know, life is short. Then fevra vairagya is somebody who has had a problem with the business or whatever. But purna vairagya is what even Buddha talked about, complete desirelessness. So that comes through this whole process of what we are doing. So we have to reach complete desirelessness, ah. and that will come to discrimination and detachment. Chair Baba, Ravi, you had something to say. Yeah, uh, what I want to say is, as long as we have a gross mind, it is not possible to be desireless. Uh, what we can do is we can divert the mind. Right now, I want a car, I want a house, I want this, I want that, I want to have entertainment, blah, 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 all these things. Suppose we became Baba lover and uh, we started reading discourses, car speaks, whatever. And then, and we are so attracted and we are enjoying the Baba gave us the be able to love him, that grace. We are enjoying all the love. When we are loving, what we are doing is we are diverting our energy from worldly things to be satisfied versus, uh, to Baba's love. All we are doing is we are focusing our uh, desires towards Baba. That's all we can do. I think uh, to be totally desireless situation, uh, it has to be a different part of our mind, maybe a higher form of mind, like a subtle mind, a mental, uh, higher, higher than that. We have to use that part of it. 
But as long as we have the gross mind, we can use simple things like loving Baba, totally surrendering to Baba, all these things, being obedient to Baba, all these things can be achieved with the gross mind. Uh, that's all I want to say. That's a great input. Oh, uh, I just want to add one more thing. Uh, Baba said it is inherent in us, right? Yes, it is inherent in us, but again, we have to see where we stand. At one time, when we reach the higher and higher levels, probably we may be desireless. But right now, uh, for sure I am. I can only speak for myself. I'm very uh, in the gross world. Jai Baba. Interesting, very, very interesting input. Yeah. So, any other questions, or um, can we go ahead to I part th two? I thought uh, I was looking at the God Speaks and, you know, pondering over my own question about latency of desirelessness. Mm -hmm. So, I guess it's something to do with the consciousness that is uh, fully evolved uh, in mm -hmm. Jivatmas. Mm -hmm. And uh, as we go through the involution and uh, that's what was mentioned uh, just now. Uh, we progress through the planes. Uh, we uncover the wheel and we see this latency, uh, you know, becoming more potent. And we drop off the sanskaras as we go through evolution. So maybe that's the meaning. But again, yeah, we got to discover ourselves. Thank you, Jai Baba. Thank you. That's exactly what I was thinking. Thank you so much, sir. Appreciate Thank you. your help. Jai Baba, I have one quick point. Sure. Uh, uh, I think if we look at the lives of many of the masters, from a uh, worldly engagement, they would do very simple things. So from, uh, um, you know, the way we engage in this world and the way we engage spiritually. So if you see many of these masters are very quiet, they do very basic things in life. If you take Kabir or any of these masters, and I think that is something very important for us as we talk about minimalism or if we really need to progress on spirituality, maybe we need to simplify you know, so that is my observation. Very interesting. Very, very we need relevant. To follow love. We need to follow love. Simple love. That's an yeah. So that, that, that apart from that, I think what Ranga said also is very, very important, right? So uh, moving from uh, you know, uh, in consciously and constantly trying to uh, lead a life of uh, least <laughs> number of funds. Is, is a is a new trend, right? He used the word minimalism, right? So minimalism has its virtue in spirituality. That's that's a good uh, point, Ranga. Can I just add something, Karthik? Sure. Yeah. Okay. Sure. I think this present situation we are going through, you know, this uh, COVID. Corona virus. Uh, yes. So <laughs> this is teaching us that minimalism or simple <laughs> living. We don't need all the all the luxuries and wants in life. Just simple, what I think essentials, which uh, uh, Kama referred to, means like, keep it simple. Absolutely. Very yeah, good. Just, my thought, huh? just, just adding to my, yeah. my, just thinking aloud. Yeah, it will get Very called good Corona. Sir. Very good point. Get, it will get called Corona Vairagya. My credit card bills have never been so low <laughs> in my entire life. Okay. Yes. <laughs> so, uh, so just, just to add, you know, sorry, I'm just uh, want to add because this thought comes to my mind. When whenever something happens in Merva, <clears throat> then that is a an indication of things to come. Jai Baba. Uh, what's that again? Did you can you repeat? Where, okay, so 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 you know at Merazad there is a tree which has got Baba's face. Yeah, that's got that's that's getting uh, you know it's getting defaced and new shoots are coming in, new branches or new um, you know parts of the tree are coming in. So this is actually what we had started with the travels of a new order, the first session. Correct. So this correct, is, this correct. is Baba's indication of a changing world order. Correct. Yeah, hey, Baba. Great. So with that, uh, if there's uh, no other comments, we'll, shall we go to part two? Yes. Okay. I take that as a yes. Conditions of happiness, part two, contentment, love, and God realization. Contentment free of self-created problems. Most of man's suffering is self-created through, through his ungoverned desires and impossible demands. Request all of you to go on mute. 
all this is unnecessary for self fulfillment if man becomes desireless and contented he will be free from his self inflicted suffering his imagination will not be constantly harassed by feverish reaching out toward things that really do not matter and he will be established in unassailable peace when an individual is thus contented he does not require any solutions to problems because the problems that confront worldly persons have disappeared he has no problems therefore he does not have to worry about their solution for him the complexities of life do not exist because his life becomes utterly simple in the state of desirelessness suffering of renunciation when a person understands desires as being merely the bondage of the spirit he decides to give them up but even when voluntary this is often a painful process the suffering that comes from purging the mind of its many desires exists even when the soul may be ready to renounce them because this decision of the soul goes counter to the inclination of the ego mind to persist through its habitual desires the renunciation of desires curtails the very life of the ego mind therefore it is a process invariably accompanied by acute suffering but such suffering is wholesome for the soul because it liberates the soul from bondage analogies not all suffering is bad when suffering leads to the eternal happiness of desirelessness it should be regarded as a blessing in disguise just as a patient may have to suffer an operation at the hands of a surgeon in order to free himself of persistent and malignant pain the soul has to welcome the suffering of renouncing desires in order to be free from the recurrent and unending suffering caused by them the suffering the soul has in renouncing desires may be very acute but it is endured because of a sense of greater freedom that comes when desires gradually disappear from the mind if an infected swelling on the body is opened and allowed to drain it gives much pain but also much relief similarly the suffering from renunciation of desires is accompanied by the compensating relief of progressive initiation into the limitless life of freedom and happiness true nature of suffering the simple life of freedom and happiness is one of the most difficult things to achieve man has complicated his life by the growth of artificial and imaginary desires and returning to simplicity amounts to the renunciation of desires desires have become an es- essential part of the limited self of man with the result that he is reluctant to abandon them unless the lesson that desires are born of ignorance is I- impressed upon his mind through acute mental suffering when an individual is confronted with great suffering through his desires he understands their true nature when such suffering comes it should be welcomed suffering may come in order to eliminate further suffering a thorn may be taken out by another thorn and suffering by suffering suffering has to come when it is of use in purging the soul of its desires it is then as necessary as medicine to a sick person suffering caused by dissatisfaction however 99% of human suffering is not necessary through obstinate ignorance people inflict suffering upon themselves and their fellow beings and then strangely enough they ask why should we suffer suffering is often symbolized by scenes of war devastated houses broken and bleeding limbs the agonies of torture and death but war does not embody any special suffering people really suffer all the time they suffer because they are not satisfied they want more and more war is more an outcome of the universal suffering of dissatisfaction than an embodiment of the representative suffering through their greed vanity and cruelty people bring untold suffering upon themselves and others selfish pursuit of happiness people are not content to create suffering only for themselves but are relentlessly zealous in creating suffering for their fellow beings everyone seeks his own happiness even at the cost of happiness of others thus giving rise to cruelty and unending wars as long as he thinks only of his own happiness he does not find it 
in the pursuit of his own individual happiness, the limited self becomes accentuated and burdensome. When someone is merely selfish, he can, in the false pursuit of separate and exclusive happiness, become utterly callous and cruel to others. But this recoils upon him by poisoning the very spring of his life. Loveless life is most unlovely. Only a life of love is worth living. Happiness through self-forgetful love. If an individual is desireless, he will not only eliminate much suffering that he causes others, but also much of his own self-created suffering. Mere desirelessness, however, cannot yield positive happiness, though it protects one from self-created suffering and goes a long way toward making true happiness possible. True happiness begins when one learns the art of right adjustment to other persons and right adjustment involves self-forgetfulness and love. Hence arises the spiritual importance of transforming a life of the limited self into a life of love. Selfless love is rare. Pure love is rare because in most cases, love becomes adulterated with selfish motives, which are surreptitiously introduced into the consciousness by the operation of accumulated bad samskaras. It is, the, it is extremely difficult to purge the consciousness of the deep-rooted ignorance that expresses itself through the idea of I and mine. For example, even when a person says that he loves his beloved, he only means that he possessively wants the beloved to be with him. The feeling of I and mine is notably present even in the expression of love. If a man sees his own son wearing tattered clothes, he does all that he can to give him good clothes and is anxious to see him happy. Under these circumstances, he would consider his own feeling toward his son as that of pure love. But in his cute, quick response to the distress of his son, the part played by the idea of mine is by no means inconsiderable. If he happened to see the son of some stranger on the street wearing tattered clothes, he would not respond as he had in the case of his own son. This shows that though he may not be fully conscious of it, his behavior towards his son was in fact largely selfish. The feeling of mind is there in the background of the mind, though it can be brought to the surface only through searching analysis. If his response to the son of a stranger is the same as, as to his own son, then only can he said to be have said to have pure and selfless love. Domain of pure love. Pure love is not a thing that can be forced upon someone, nor can it be snatched away from another by force. It has to be manifest from within with unfettered spontaneity. What can be achieved through bold decision is the removal of those factors that prevent the manifestation of pure love. The achievement of selflessness may be said to be both difficult and easy. It is difficult for those who have not decided to step out of the limited self, and it is easy for those who have so decided. In the absence of firm determination, attachments connected with the limited self are too strong to break through. But if a person resolves to set aside selfishness at any cost, he finds an easy entry into the domain of pure love. Need for bold decision. The limited self is like an external coat worn by the soul. Just as an individual may take off his coat by the exercise of will, through a bold decisive step, he can make up his mind to shed the limited self and get rid of it once and for all. The task that otherwise would be difficult becomes easy through the exercise of a bold and unyielding decision. Such, such a decision can be born in his mind only when he feels an intense longing for pure love. Just as someone who is hungry longs for food, an aspirant who wants to experience pure love must have an intense longing for it. True love awakened only by master. When the aspirant has developed this intense longing for pure love, he may be said to have been prepared for the intervention of a perfect master who through proper direction and necessary help ushers him into the state of divine love. 
only the master can awaken pure love through the divine love that he imparts there is no other way only the master can awaken pure love through the divine love that he imparts there is no other way those who want to be consumed in love should go to the eternal flame of love love is the most significant thing in life it cannot be awakened except by coming into contact with the incarnation of love theoretical brooding on love will result in weaving a theory about love but the heart will remain as empty as before love begets love it cannot be awakened by any me- mechanical means love leads to god realization when true love is awakened in the aspirant it leads him to the realization of god and opens up the unlimited field of lasting and unfading happiness the happiness of god realization is the goal of all creation it is not possible for a person to have the slightest idea of that inexpressible happiness without actually having the experience of godhood the idea that the worldly have of suffering or happiness is entirely limited the real happiness that comes through realizing god is worth all the physical and mental suffering in the universe then all suffering is as if it had never been happiness of god realization those who are not god realized can control their minds through yoga to such an extent that nothing makes them feel pain or suffering even if they are buried alive or thrown into boiling oil but though the advanced yogis can brave and annul any suffering they do not experience the happiness of realizing god when one becomes god everything else is zero the happiness of god realization therefore cannot suffer curtailment by anything the happiness of god realization is self sustained eternally fresh and unfading boundless and indescribable it is for this happiness that the world has sprung into existence so that brings us to the end of part 2 opening it up for uh, questions i have kamas hand gone up already so kama or maybe that was from last time. i i I'm sorry i think it must be the hand must be from the last one but i was waiting for questions sure but, uh, sorry but it, i i don't look at the hands because as i said it's not complete the functionality is weak um go ahead um and uh, i look uh, anybody else any questions can i say something can you all hear sure. me yes i think the last few lines are very significantly important yes can i just read it again the happiness of god realization is self sustained eternally fresh and unfading Endless and indescribable. It is for this happiness that the world has sprung into existence. It's very, very profound. Very profound. Absolutely. Yeah. There is this uh, line in the second last paragraph, which are very powerful. Those who want to be consumed in love should go to the eternal flame of love. Love yeah. is the most significant thing in life. It cannot be awakened except by coming in contact with the incarnation of love. theoretical brooding on love will result in weaving a theory about love but the heart will remain empty as before so these are very powerful lines yes yes absolutely yeah. you may highlight them if you want yeah yeah that's a good idea any other uh, comments questions the last line of the chapter is the summary of creation i think yeah the happiness of god realization is self sustained eternally fresh and unfading boundless and indescribable yeah but how do you say it's no. creation last this last, last line, line of the of chapter, chapter. it is for this happiness that the world has sprung into existence Yeah. 
Game of Love, ya, Jai Baba. Ya, 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 ya. Kak Sunil had uh, some doubts yesterday or uh, day before, saying that what is this for all uh, uh, creation? <clears throat> Why uh, God has created and then what is the purpose? Yeah. yeah. Yes, Mama, we went through that, so I don't <laughs> to repeat that one. <laughs> it was a long discussion. Yeah. Thank you. Thank so, you. Kama, over to you. You want to summarize and uh, give in your thoughts, given there are no more questions? Yeah, Jay Baba, can you hear yeah. me? Yes. Yeah. So, I think these two chapters, Conditions of Happiness, Part 1, Part 2, is uh, very practical and uh, the takeaway from this for me was uh, the tree of desire has two kinds of fruits. One is called pleasure, which is sweet. And the other one is bitter, which is pain. So the summary here is if you want to experience the tree of desire, you have to be ready to accept both pleasure and pain. Otherwise, you have to have desirelessness and the paradox about life is that uh, uh, we are actually caught up in our desires attachments because of evolution because of organic and inorganic samskaras but technically as a human being we don't need anything you know so that is why the statement the happiness of god realization is the goal of a human being Easy to understand, difficult to achieve. Second thing, what I like about this chapter is that you can have complete detachment, but if you don't work with people, if you don't go out and share your happiness with others, you know, then it's not complete, you know. So that was something I found very interesting because I'm going through that. Mm -hmm. I thought, let me be detached. Why should I be bothered about others? So, you know, let me first become attached to dispassionate but it clearly Very says important. that if you want to have pure love second again as nigam said the incarnation of love which is uh, baba or any of the perfect masters they are the only ones who manifest pure love and again pure love is the gift of the perfect master which we read in the love chapter so um, I mean, there are so many aspects in this particular chapter which we can talk about. But I think the important thing is first to have detachment, dispassion, discrimination. I call it D raised to four or D raised to five. Detachment, dispassion, discrimination, determination. So all these things are very important during this journey. And second thing is, in the material life, we realize that we need to experience all this, you know, uh, I could see my own life. You know, when I was working on Wall Street, I had my work, you know, breakfast in Geneva, lunch in Paris and dinner in Amsterdam. I had to go through this very interesting period. But I realized that these are all temporary. So one has to go through these experiences and then go into the spiritual journey. And basically the whole goal is God realization. And I think God speaks and discourses, gives us a, you know, kind of a framework. How do we discriminate? But once you have pure love, again, I emphasize, then you don't need any of that. But till we reach that pure love state, we need to go through this process. Okay, Bob. What are the very four well Ds said. again? In, Jai, yeah, yeah, very well said. Very well said. Um, yeah. uh, what are yeah, the four Ds again? The four Ds, D raised to four, detachment, dispassion, dispassion. discrimination, Desirelessness and determination. So it's five. Undeter there are five. five. <laughs> yeah, <zero. laughs> and dancing and dancing to his tunes. Well, uh, <laughs> see, I think and, that, you yeah. know, just to add, I've just given you one D. I call it the A B C D E F G A for awareness, B for being. C for contentment, cheerfulness. D e for, as I already told you, D raised to five. E for enthusiasm, equipoise. And F is faith. 
the three kinds of faith faith in yourself faith in the perfect master and faith in life so these are my a b c d e f from baba's discourses jai baba jai baba beautiful wow, jai baba wow. kamal ji thank, nice. thank you thank you amazing jai baba jai baba kama i can add one i for you so as you <laughs> as we move from and this is what i got in my meditation today as you move from illusion to illumination you need the process of involution so there's a three yes. eyes yeah wow why <laughs> wow we <laughs> also read something in one of the chapters inspiration intuition illumination there are many eyes of course the ipad and the iphone mm-hmm. but actually i was telling somebody the most important thing is baba oils or you can call it a boils our inner force loving self so whenever we are having a boil on our skin we can always think of baba our inner most loving self <laughs> jai baba great so i think we we are uh, we still have a couple of minutes so if there's any questions we can take it can i, can I pose a question sure question go ahead ravi uh whenever we achieve something or desire we experience happiness and the experience uh, we experience certain time and over certain time uh, what happens it fades off we, pla- we pass our high school uh, uh 7th grade or 8th grade i'm sorry the higher scale 10th grade plus 1 plus 2 whatever Mm-hmm. then when we get the results we enjoy over time it fades off and then we go to the new thing why does it fade off when does it uh, sustain for a longer period of time i i i i, I, I rest now i ask a loaded answer. questions and i ask a loaded question in response to ravi's query has anybody of you had Uh, an experience of lasting happiness <laughs> right so I, i i think the answer lies in the question that i just asked in the sense that yes. there is there uh, is the happiness that we relate to now is only temporary right so it is only uh, uh, something that will last uh, till the next suffering to get the next level of happiness maybe i used the wrong word uh, suffering but basically you know you know you get the drift uh, I, is is my reaction to ravi anybody else uh, we we keep craving for new things so once we go ahead in our craving then the old one whatever we enjoy is of no significance yeah i know i got beaten up for this once but uh, i i love the uh, the maslow's for that right the maslow's theory so it uh, it it gives you the the logical reason for how lower desires get replaced by higher desires and the highest desire is self actualization right so you go through this hierarchy of desires and lower desires no longer motivate you after you have achieved them they can no, no longer excite you and they don't give you happiness even on a day right so anyway um, that's that's what i'd like to say ravi are we rambling or i i just want one comment on this question i have sorry uh, sorry uh, yeah go ahead make your comment then i'll have nomita jump in the comment is uh, i do not know the answer but uh, is our soul looking for permanent happiness that is bad realization so when we experience uh, some desires fulfilling desires the mind goes to some happiness and then goes down because it's not reaching its uh, what it uh, desires for the god realization is that what it is i'm not sure just a thought came sure navita yeah uh, unending happiness for me is in baba's thought so all desires or whatever else settles down very easily and all the ripples just set into a 
uh, serene play. And that period, I would say, is unending happiness. Yeah. I have a question for that also. Does it end? If I talk to you in between, it may. <laughs> <laughs> My God, you're too much. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so uh, any any reactions to Ravi's and Namita's point? Just remember, Baba. Yeah. Yeah, Jay Baba, this is Kamma here. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, listening to the comments, uh, one is uh, when you were talking about lasting happiness, uh, it's a very relative phrase because each person is different. So the lasting happiness can apply to many different situations uh, during the waking state. The mm -hmm. common thing I believe in lasting happiness is when you go into deep sleep and you're unconscious of the bliss that we experience. So that is a form of lasting habit. We want to bring it into the waking state. Number two, when you talk about desires, basically, it's a very renunciation of desires means that we should not get attached to any. As I said, I just had a good cup of coffee on the break now. I am allowed to enjoy it and I don't want to make an impression that I need to have this again tomorrow. That is just a subtle difference that you learn when you do Vipassana meditation. A lot of people get confused about renunciation of desires. I think it is the attachment aspect that kills the process of the spiritual journey. So I believe that from my own experience that uh, it is the thinking mind ego which is creating all these desires and keeps us swinging between suppression and uh, uh, what we call the opposite of suppression and suppression is indulgence, you know, which we read in the chapter on sex and marriage. So. I think to go beyond that is to be aware. And one of my techniques is like I'm now sitting in the car and uh, driving and I'm talking to you. Every moment becomes a form of self-awareness and that is a form of lasting happiness. When we start compartmentalizing desires, then we get into a problem. But if everything you do in life becomes a form of self-awareness to have lasting happiness every moment in being, not being. Okay. Good uh, points. Any other uh, reactions? Good point. Well, Very good point. Um, good. So let's keep that thought and uh, um, uh, apply more of uh, what Nomita said, bring more Baba into our lives and uh, practice all that we have learned and have a great day. Jai Baba. 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 See you all tomorrow. Jai Baba. Jai Baba. Jai Baba. Jai Baba. Jai Baba.